Hans Werner, Minister Schäuble, Galinda, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here today and an honor to participate in this important event. I have been an admirer and a friend of Hans Werner for many years. We share common interests as economists, including taxation and monetary policy. The IFO Institute and the National Bureau of Economic Research, which I headed for 30 years, have been successful partners. Hans Werner himself has been a research associate of the NBR since the 1980s. And I like to think that he modeled the CES IFO research network on what we did at the NBR since the network here has become the foremost one in Europe. For my remarks today, I have chosen a subject that is important in the United States as well as here in the Eurozone, the relation of monetary policy and financial risks. The good news is that the American economy has essentially reached full employment with an overall unemployment rate of just 5%. But the unconventional monetary policy that has brought the US to this condition and that many hope will do the same here in the Eurozone created financial risks that could hurt both economies in the years ahead. In the United States, the Federal Reserve's unconventional monetary policy, quantitative easing or QE, consisted of buying large quantities of bonds and promising to keep short-term rates close to zero. The ECB has followed the Fed in adopting a similar quantitative easing strategy. And as you know, the short-term interest rates are actually negative in many of the Eurozone countries, and the yield on German 10-year bunds is less than 1%. The extremely low interest rates resulting from the Fed's QE policy carry risks to our future financial stability. While those risks may not materialize, it is also possible that they will cause widespread financial losses and a new economic downturn. Europe's persistent low interest rates are creating similar risks here. The ECB's goals for its quantitative easing policy are, however, different from the Fed's because the financial markets of Europe are very different from those of the United States. As I'll explain, the ECB has therefore been less effective than the Fed in raising growth and achieving price stability, and I think is likely to remain so in the future. It's useful to understand why the Federal Reserve adopted unconventional monetary policy in the first place. Economic downturns in the United States generally occur when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to reverse high inflation or to prevent an increase in the rate of inflation. And when it believes that inflation is under control, the Fed can lower rates and reverse the downturn. But the downturn in 2008 was not caused by previous monetary tightening and therefore couldn't be reversed by lowering term interest rates. It was the result of a mispricing of assets, including both financial assets and real assets like owner-occupied housing. Between 2000 and 2006, real house prices in the United States had increased by more than 60% above the long-term trend. Stimulated by very low mortgage rates and by loans to borrowers with less than the usual ability to service those mortgages. Many of those so-called subprime mortgage loans were syndicated and the resulting collections of mortgages were used to create separate tranches of varying degrees of risk. 
Loans to subprime borrowers with low credit scores and limited repayment capacity were therefore used to create securities that appeared very safe and were rated as AAA by rating agencies. A simplified example will indicate how that process worked. A bank could take 1,000 subprime mortgage loans and create separate investment tranches with different degrees of risk. The riskiest tra tranche would require the investor to share in the losses of the first 100 mortgages that default. That was effectively a junk bond bearing a high yield. The second riskiest tranche would require the investor to share losses only after 100 mortgages had defaulted up to a total of 200 defaults. Since the probability that uh, more than 10% of the original 1,000 mortgages would default seemed relatively low, this second tranche was considered safer, had a higher rating, and a lower yield. In this way, additional tranches of greater and greater safety were created. Investors in the fifth tranche, for example, would only bear a loss if more than 400 of the original 1,000 mortgages had defaulted. The probability that more than 40% would default seems so low that this tranche could be rated AAA even though the underlying mortgages were all subprime. These ratings turned out to be too optimistic. When the bubble in house prices burst and house prices fell rapidly, Widespread defaults on subprime mortgages caused sharp falls in the prices of mortgage tranches that had been assumed to be very safe. And this acted as a signal to investors in other very different securities that risk had been underestimated and that risky assets were generally overpriced. The prices of many assets fell rapidly the Standard & Poor's price index of 500 stocks fell nearly 20% in 12 months, and it lost 50% of its value by March of 2009. It was also often impossible to obtain market prices for mortgage-backed securities and other risky assets. Financial institutions, banks, and others therefore did not know the value of their own portfolios and couldn't judge the solvency and liquidity of potential counterparties. As a result, they were unwilling to lend to other financial institutions, and the entire financial system became dysfunctional. The Fed responded in the traditional way. It lowered short-term interest rates from 5.3% to 4.3%, and eventually down to less than 1% by October of 2008. But in the dysfunctional financial environment, a reduction in short-term interest rates was essentially ineffective. The Fed did a variety of other things in partnership with the Treasury, but these actions were also not sufficient to revive the economy. The Obama administration concluded that economic recovery required a large fiscal stimulus. President Obama asked Congress for $300 billion a year for three years. That turned out to be too little to generate a healthy recovery. The collapse of consumer spending and of home building had created a hole in aggregate demand that it was much larger than the $300 billion that Congress provided. Moreover, the package of programs that the Congress created was so poorly designed that it probably added more to the national debt than it did to aggregate demand. So the Federal Reserve concluded that neither traditional monetary policy nor the so-called fiscal stimulus could achieve an adequate recovery. It responded then by creating its unconventional monetary policy, large-scale purchases, of long-term bonds and a commitment to keep short-term rates low. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke explained that this new policy would depress interest rates at every maturity 
inducing portfolio investors to shift into equities, while the unprecedentedly low mortgage interest rates would raise house prices. The result would be an increase in household net worth that would raise consumer spending and accelerate the economic recovery. Thus, quantitative easing was very different from the traditional monetary policy, which aims at stimulating interest-sensitive spending. In contrast, quantitative easing used monetary policy to increase households' net worth and therefore to increase consumer spending. That strategy worked well. House prices rose 13% in the year 2013 alone, and equity prices rose by 30% during those same 12 months. As a result, the net worth of households increased by $10 trillion in that year. That induced consumers to increase spending, and that caused the level of GDP to rise. Now, the ECB has been following a similar strategy of large-scale asset purchases and extremely low, indeed negative, short-term interest rates. But the purpose of the ECB's quantitative easing is very different from what the Fed was trying to do. Since Europe lacks the widespread share ownership that exists in the United States, quantitative easing cannot be used to stimulate consumer spending by raising household wealth. A major but unspoken purpose of the ECB's low interest rate policy is to stimulate net exports by depressing the value of the euro. The euro's value fell 25% from $1.40 in the summer of 2014 to just $1.06 in the fall of 2015. Although this has stimulated net exports, the impact has so far been quite limited. Here's why. Most trade of Eurozone countries is with other Eurozone countries that use the same currency, and exports to the United States don't benefit much from the decline of the euro because European exporters generally invoice their exports in dollars and adjust their dollar prices very slowly. Total net exports from the eurozone rose by less than 3 billion euros between September of 2014 and a year later, a negligible amount in an economy of 11 trillion, 11 trillion euros. A further motive of the ECB's bond buying is to increase the cash the Eurozone banks have to lend. Because they receive only a negative return on funds deposited at the ECB, the ECB hopes that the banks will use their increased cash to increase loans to businesses and consumers. As of now, however, there has been relatively little increase in such lending. The ECB is eager to raise the inflation rate to its target of just under 2%. The Federal Reserve has a similar goal with respect to increasing the rate of inflation, but the mechanisms for achieving that goal differ between the US and Europe. The Fed expects that QE will raise the U.S. inflation rate by reducing unemployment to a level at which inflation accelerates. As I've indicated, we're pretty close to that now. That strategy may not work in Europe because the Eurozone unemployment rate is now nearly 12%, about five percentage points higher than it was before the recession began. The ECB's QE probably can achieve higher inflation only through the increase in import prices that result from a decline in the value of the euro. This limited process still leaves inflation in the eurozone below 1%, indeed close to zero. In short, QE in the eurozone is likely to have a smaller favorable impact on employment and inflation than in the United States. 
while also incurring the risks that follow from excessively low interest rates. So that brings me back to the financial risks that QE has created in the US and in Europe. The price earnings ratio of the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index is now, despite the sharp fall in the last week or so, is now even higher than it had been before the economic downturn and is about 30% higher than its historic average. These very high share prices might make sense if the level of interest rates would remain permanently at today's low level. But when interest rates rise, as they eventually must, the current high price earnings ratio will no longer be justified. The mispricing of long-term assets extends also to bonds and to commercial real estate. Investors are also being driven in their reach for yield to take credit risk as well as duration risk. Banks are making loans to lower quality borrowers and loans with fewer restrictions on the borrowers. If there's an economic downturn, there will be losses on these high risk loans. Similar increases in risk are happening in the Eurozone. The yield on Italy's 10 year sovereign debt is just 1.4% even though Italy's debt is more than 100% of its GDP and is continuing to rise. A normalization of interest rates will eventually bring losses to such investors. Moreover, in the Eurozone's private debt market, covenant light loans now constitute nearly half of all institutional lending. It's clear that a wide range of assets is mispriced, and that substantial risks are being taken by investors and lenders. What is not clear is whether this creates a risk to the financial system as a whole that could lead to an economic downturn as it did in 2008 and 2009. The Federal Reserve finally began the process of raising the federal funds interest rate at its December meeting. Unfortunately, the minutes of that meeting show that members did not take financial stability risks into account in setting the future path of interest rates. The Fed instead stressed that the federal funds rate will rise only very slowly in order to increase aggregate demand. As long as interest rates remain low, investors will continue to have the incentive to reach free yield by taking excessive risks, increasing the mispricing of assets, and risks of a more serious instability. Federal Reserve officials have emphasized that their goal is limited, limited to the two congressionally mandated ones of maximum employment and price stability, leaving the achievement of financial stability to what they called macroprudential policies. The obvious problem is that it's not clear what those macroprudential policies are in the United States or what they should be. And I'm afraid the same applies in the Eurozone as well. The one clear example of a macroprudential policy is the increased capital requirements that have been imposed on the commercial banks. But in the United States, at least, commercial banks are responsible for only about one third of total credit creation. So even if the banking system were completely safe, substantial sources of vulnerability would remain. So that is where we are, but what of the future? It is worth asking how risk-creating monetary policies could be avoided in the future, and what the Eurozone can do now to limit its continued reliance solely on the ECB's quantitative easing. In most economic downturns, traditional monetary policy is enough to achieve a recovery, and it is therefore the appropriate policy. Those downturns tend to be relatively short and shallow, and there's no need to drive down long-term rates by buying bonds and committing to a long period of low rates.
Moreover, in a typical downturn, discretionary fiscal policy is also unnecessary and is likely to have destabilizing effects on the economy. There are long lags between the start of a cyclical downturn and the time that the political process is able to put in place an effective fiscal stimulus. Using discretionary fiscal policy to stimulate the economy in a short downturn can therefore result in adding excessive stimulus when the economy is already expanding. But not all downturns are typical, and the massive downturn that began at the end of 2007 couldn't be reversed by conventional open market operations. Moreover, it was soon clear that the downturn was going to be deeper and longer than the usual recession, reducing the risk that fiscal policy would be mistimed. So an expansionary fiscal policy was, in my judgment, appropriate at that time. Unfortunately, the fiscal policy that was actually enacted in 2009 was very badly designed and inadequate to deal with the magnitude of the demand shortfall. Moreover, there's always the danger that a large fiscal stimulus would cause financial markets to anticipate large future deficits and a rising level of government debt. That could cause long-term rates to rise, offsetting the favorable effect of the fiscal package. That could be avoided by combining a short-term fiscal stimulus with changes in entitlement programs that would stabilize the long-term level of the debt. Now, although that may be the economically desirable strategy, it may not be politically feasible. It is possible, however, to design a fiscal policy that provides a net stimulus to the economy without increasing even the near-term size of the national debt. That possibility is particularly important now in the Eurozone, where debt levels are already very high, and it is therefore important to avoid increasing current budget deficits. The key to such a revenue-neutral fiscal strategy is to use specific investment incentives, such as an investment tax credit, to increase the profitability of new investment, thereby encouraging firms to invest. The cost of this incentive could be financed with a temporary increase in the corporate tax. The combination, the investment tax credit, would raise the profitability of new investment, while the higher corporate tax rate would fall on existing capital. Such revenue-neutral fiscal policies have the added advantage that they can be designed and scaled at the level of the individual country. While monetary policy is constrained to be the same for the entire Eurozone, the combination of monetary and fiscal policy can be tailored to national conditions. These revenue-neutral fiscal policies may not be enough to deal with the downturn of the magnitude that occurred in the United States and in Europe after 2007. But the revenue-neutral fiscal policies would be a useful supplement to conventional monetary policy, limiting the need for unconventional monetary policies or the scale of such policies. And here in the Eurozone, adopting such revenue-neutral fiscal policies now would be a useful supplement to the ECB's policy of quantitative easing and might succeed in stimulating demand and employment. Thank you very much.